So, uh, really, curiosity is something I think differs um, something alive from something dead. Uh, when somebody is alive, be it human being, amoeba, or a stone, we see the difference. But what I believe is that curiosity is the mechanism that leads us to discovery. So there are lots of ways that may, might lead us to discoveries, to the, the top of the hill, but one of them is through curiosity and through interesting way of using curiosity to reach there. Two important questions that we always ask ourselves since our childhood is what and why. I think first we ask what. Sometime later we ask question why. Being pathophysiologists, we are used to think of why a bit more than about what. What does it mean is that when we are thinking why, we go deeper, we go higher. Um, I just sometimes wonder whether there is a curiosity gene. Well, of course, only British scientists may discover such a gene. There is no such a single gene, but set of genes promote our curiosity. And that's why we are such intelligent human beings. So evolution requires actually curiosity. If we weren't that curious, we wouldn't be such interesting, not maybe the best animals, but intelligent, I'm sure. Well, um, another issue that we should add to this curiosity is that we should try to find out gaps between what is known and what is unknown. One such nice example I think is very instructive, interesting, teaching us lots of things, is example of Aaron Chikanover, who received his Nobel Prize for discovery of ubiquitin proteasome system. When he was asking to his colleagues, to physicians, etc., what happens to uh, remnants of reticulocyte when it becomes mature and becomes a red blood cell? And everybody said, ah, something happens, I don't know. I don't know, it disappears somehow. So we feel that there is a gap in the knowledge, that others do not pay too much attention. Then he asked another question. Well, what, why meat becomes damaged so fast when it is out of refrigerator at high temperature and in our body we have 37 degrees Celsius? Why our meat, why our muscles are not wasting up and they are not damaged? They said, oh, we don't know how to go away, etc. But he kept this question, he revealed this gap, and he eventually received Nobel Prize. And probably one thing that was important for me to inspire, and I want to share this, the same idea again and again, that, that gaps that he discovered, plus his curiosity, promote his way to the hill. So he found that they cover this gap with a very leaky argument. Another important issue to me is that we should ask right questions. Do they, do they answer my question? It's a common thing for all of us. When we were students, we were asking a question and teacher with a very intelligent expression on face answers quite other question. Then we say, mm, yeah, maybe, yeah, thank you very much. But actually, that was not my question. Either he didn't understand me, okay, it happens, but or he, he says something is known, while we were asking something unknown. So sometimes we feel that maybe they don't really know the answer. And here's the moment when I think that we, each of us, should go in. We should say, okay, let me try to answer that question. And I think we should add one more component to what I mentioned already, is that we should learn from beauty of the nature that created all of us, because there are real rules that apply to many processes. I hope you 
don't lose co contact with the context because of medical issues, but actually it applies to the world in general, I think so. But do we ask our students as teachers the right questions? Do we check their ability to ask that questions? What we actually do is we check whether they are able to respond properly to known information. Unfortunately, we are not checking ability of students to create questions, to generate ideas. We just check whether they have read or not. This is, I think, some kind of challenge for education in general. But let's go beyond, because our best teachers really do ask that questions, and best students go ahead. So in particular, one such question was, well, what about Hosh? They say that in November, it's very nice, Sunday morning, I hope that only a few of us did the same thing today, uh, it's, it's very good to eat this nice, delicious food. It's made of uh, cow's feet, rich with cartilage, and they say that it promotes our wound healing. Well, is it so, or just a legend, just a story to promote eating? Well, let's keep this question in mind. Nobody would say yes or no, definitely today. But what I mean by saying let's learn from nature, that Lots of nice molecules are not produced from beginning when we need them. Usually nature produces molecules ready to be released at the moment we need them in order not to lose time. Lots of such examples, to mention a few. Angiotensin II is a molecule made from angiotensinogen. It was circulating in our blood for a long, long time until we need it and we cut it and two proteolytic events and we have very important vasoconstrictor angiotensin II. Bradykinin with opposite function, a hero of complement cascade made from huge high molecular weight kininogen. As we need, we cut it. As we need, we cut coagulation cascade fragments and in a cascade way, one to another, they activate each other. That's why we are able to stop bleeding when we have a wound. Much elegant example, I think, is complement cascade. When we break down so-called complement C3 fragment, and the result is that we do not have only one, but we have two interesting, wonderful mediators. One used for later phagocytosis, being an opson in C3B. The other becomes an important uh, agent, mediator, to promote mast cell degranulation. So what I mean in general is that nature is not breaking down something just by chance. Everything is used later. So I come closer to my main idea. Well, what happens in wound is that our neutrophils, our leukocytes, tend to come to the site of the damage to restore. And what I want to focus is that when they go there, this is the wound, when they pass, they need to break down basal membrane of our vessels. That is the most important po point, because up to now there is no specific knowledge what happens to that collagen when this leukocyte, through nice series of events, when it rolls first, then it finally firmly adheres, then passes and releases proteases to break down collagen. That's the point. Okay, when finally it will reach bacteria, destroy them, and etc. But what happens to those fragments of collagen? This is how I imagine collagen break down by neutrophil. What happens to those products? Well, I believe that it's not just by chance. One theory says that, okay, you have building blocks from those 
break down products, you can still use them for production of new collagen later for wound healing. But given the fact that the more collagen was broken down, means the more need for future wound repair we need. If so, maybe this is a new growth factor. Through the selective breakdown of this collagen, we might have a growth factor or master regulator of wound healing is actually a macrophage or the macrophage. Maybe this would be signal for macrophage to turn into fashion of wound healing. I don't know whether it's true or not. Um, but what I believe is that this information should not be lost. Amount of broken collagen fragments would tell to the tissue how much to repair. You know, when wound healing process is well organized and orchestrated, everything is fine and we don't even notice how we repair it. But when it's damaged, it may ultimately lead to fibrosis, scarring, and even death. So what I think is that maybe this would lead, if we better understand this, it may lead us to more chances of having people like this standing up and saying that we did this. In this or that way, I think something like this could be a route to discovery, to invention. Something that I think that is built in each of us, it's in us, our uh, desire for inventions. So I hope that all of us would have small or big inventions. Thank you very much.